Good afternoon and welcome to today's EHS Today webcast, Creating a Culture of Safety Through Contractor Management, How Xcel Energy Achieved Greater Than 90% Compliance in Contractor Safety. I'm Sandy Smith and I'm Editor-in-Chief for EHS Today, and in a moment I'll turn things over to our speakers. First of all, I would like to thank Browse for sponsoring this afternoon's webcast. If at any time you experience audio difficulties or have trouble advancing the slides, simply press your F5 key to refresh your webinar console. I also would like to encourage you to add questions for our panelists. As a question occurs to you, type it in the box on the right-hand side of your screen, and we will address as many of your questions at the end of our presentation as possible. And now, let me introduce today's presenters. Brett Armstrong is a Vice President with Browse. And joining Brett today will be Joe Conrad, Manager of Safety and Training with Excel Energy, and Gil Decock, Director of Professional Services for Browse. For more information about our speakers, click on the speaker widget on your console toolbar. And now let's get this presentation underway. To begin, I have a poll question for our audience. In your opinion, how effectively has your company established a culture of safety by pre-qualifying and managing your contractors, suppliers, and vendors? Very effectively, somewhat effectively, somewhat ineffectively, or very ineffectively? And with that, Brett, the floor is yours. All right, great. Thank you very much, Sandy. I really appreciate those introductions. Uh, you know, and, and I want to thank everyone in advance for taking just a moment to answer that poll question. It's really very helpful for us as we uh, present to the audience. Uh, if we have a better sense of where you're at in this process, uh, maybe some of the challenges that you're currently uh, facing, just so that we can focus our comments appropriately. As those uh, responses come in, I was looking over the list. We've got a very diverse group of organizations who have joined us today. I see many from uh, the manufacturing industry, uh, pharmaceuticals, utilities, construction. And I believe we also saw a few uh, contractors who may already be registered with Browse. So we just want to thank everyone for joining and uh, really look forward to the presentation today. So it looks like we've got the, uh, the results coming in. Uh, it looks like the, the better part of the group uh, is saying that they feel like they are working somewhat effectively in pre-qualifying uh, their contractors and suppliers. Uh, and and then the, the latter half, it looks like there's a bit of work to do. So, again, very helpful information. Regardless of where you fall in that spectrum, I think you're going to find that Joe and Gil have some great insight. Uh, they'll be able to provide some uh, suggestions that I think you'll find to be very effective as you move forward in establishing that culture of safety that we're all uh, hoping to achieve. So with that, Joe, maybe I'll just ask if you could give us a little bit of background on Excel Energy for those who may not be familiar with the organization. and. Uh, just, just turn the time over to you. All right, thank you, Brett. Well, again, I'd like to echo Brett's thoughts. Uh, appreciate everybody giving us some time today. I hope that everybody takes away something valuable from this conversation and really looking forward to the question and answer portion at the end. To start, I'd like to tell you that XL Energy has a strong safety culture where we actively drive our relationships with our contractors to a level of partnership. To us, there is really no discernible difference other than the color of the hard hat between our employees and our partners, and together we're on a journey to zero. Journey to zero is about creating a safer work environment for all employees and contractors. It's Excel Energy's commitment to developing culture where safety is deliberate and essential. It's about taking personal responsibility for our personal safety and for the safety of those around us. This value proposition is the foundation of our organization. So a little bit about us. Um, Xcel Energy is a U.S. investor-owned utility, electric and natural gas company with regulated operations in eight Midwestern and Western states. We're based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. We provide comprehensive portfolio of energy-related products and services throughout four wholly-owned utility sub subseries. Um, the states that we serve are Colorado, Michigan, Minnesota, New Mexico, North Dakota, South Dakota, Texas, and Wisconsin. Um, currently, we have just over 12,500 employees, total revenues of $11.7 billion. Um, our electric operations has revenues of $9.5 billion and 3.5 million customers on the natural gas side. 
natural gas revenues, 2.1 billion, customers, 2 million. And then on the generation side of our portfolio, we do have 76 generation plants with a net dependable capacity of just over 17,000 megawatts. Um, you know, so that's who we are as an organizational makeup. But what I would tell you, um, some other things that we're really proud of as an organization is that we're the number one wind provider in the nation for the past 12 consecutive years. And as an organization, we're deeply committed to the communities that we serve, and that's evident by the $5.4 million that we contribute to the United Way annually, $3.5 million in focus area grants, 11.3, excuse me, $13.6 million in total giving. And our employees um, have volunteered almost 28,000 hours back into the community, and we've given just shy of $88 million to low income and energy assistance in 2015. A little bit about more my team. So I am the manager of safety and training for contractor safety for XL Energy. And the contractor safety team is supporting XL Energy's cultural improvements by facilitating an effective contractor safety program through thoughtful guidance, training, and objectives that support our value of providing a safe and healthy workplace for its employees and contractors. It's really our fundamental belief that the contractor safety team, that our program and processes not only support our journey to zero and the personal safety of our employees and contractors, but also is driving deep value for the organization. I have a privilege to lead a group of safety professionals that are truly dedicated to an unyielding pursuit of that goal. Okay, great. Thanks, Joe. Obviously, very, uh, very impressive uh, organization. One of the things that stood out to me as you were talking about uh, about those that you're hiring, that you're working with, uh, you referred to them as partners. You know, it, w it wasn't a reference to uh, to those that, that we hire, but, but, but partners. Do you find that that is part of the culture there to excel? Uh, you know, I know it's something that Gil's talked about, just that mutual respect that you have with those that are coming on site. Yeah, I think most certainly, Brett. I think that, you know, we not only call the contractors and vendors that come in to support you know, our operations as partners, we really engage with them at that level. I think it'll be imperative kind of in today's conversation about our processes and programs that for us to be successful, we've truly defined that we have to partner with our contractors. We hire them for a reason. Um, you know, really, they need to come in and we need them to support the, the business continuity of our operations. But two, they're the subject matter experts. So if we can engage with them at a partnership level, we've found that we can be successful really from learning and growing together. Okay, fantastic. And, and just out of curiosity, do you know how long uh, Browse has been working with Excel? Yeah, we've been engaged for uh, about four years now. November 2012 is when we officially announced to the organization that we had accepted a third-party administrator, and that administrator was going to be Browse. Um, at that point, we started developing in partnership with Browse, kind of our implementation plan that has got us to where we are today. So, Joe, can you talk to just a little bit about what the process was like before uh, the implementation of Browse, how the organization was operating in terms of pre-qualifying and managing uh, those partners that you hired? Sure. Uh, I'll take you back to really 2009, um, which was the birth of our contractor safety program as we see it today. We have, in our feeling, uh, a very robust and systematic approach to managing our contractors. And in 2009 um, is when that program kind of came to light to include a lot of our historic processes that are supporting the program. Um, you know, going back pre-Browse, we did a lot of the things that we currently do um, with Browse. Um, we were just doing them internally. Um, we had, uh, like I said, a very robust program. Um, embedded processes within that program. We had appendices to the program that would specifically um, engage our contract partners in giving us statistical information and really surface level programmatic information. Um, so a little more detail around that. We had um, really a, a one-page document that we would send out manually to the contractor, and we would ask them about their statistical information from a safety perspective, and then just ask simple questions about, do you have a safety program? Do you utilize subcontractors? And really some surface level questions that they would ask, yes or no. Um, never taking that deeper than the surface, um, just really acknowledging the fact that they had the programs. And if they did, then our internal folks on my team would take a review of those contractor stats 
and the way they answered that questionnaire, and depending on where they fell out statistically and programmatically, we'd go a couple different routes where we would take and potentially write conditions for approval or disapprove contractors basically off of that surface level information we received. So, so maybe two questions from that. At the time, uh, how was that information being stored and was there any process in place to monitor or uh, requalify uh, those contractors throughout the year? Yeah, there was. And again, kind of going back to the collection of data, we had built some, some in-house, you know, the contractor safety team built some, some trending and some repositories for that information. Um, the one thing that, that we found as we started engaging in the thoughts of moving towards the TPA and looking at partnering with Browse is that we had a lot of inefficiencies in our process. It was really manually driven. Um, it was effective, and, and we were moving in the right direction. However, it was pretty labor-intensive for us. Um, so we did have um, some processes, some processes that we still use today in managing our contractors on the outside of our browse portfolio, um, but it, it seemed to be pretty labor intensive for us. So, so would you say that administration was the greatest challenge that you faced, or, or were there other elements at the time that, that you were struggling with? Yeah, I, I think originally, um, when we took our first shot at, at looking at engaging with the TPA, um, the thought was is that, you know, if we could have moved, remove some of the administrative burden of the processes that were supporting our contractor safety program, we'd be in a much better place. So that was really the, the first catalyst for us to move in the, in the direction. Um, you know, we, we recognize really not only on the safety side of the organization, but also on the operations side of our organization, there was a lot of project managers where a lot of their time was being consumed of not necessarily managing their project and the safety of their project, but managing through the administrative side of getting their contractor in and getting them approved. And it seemed like we had a lot of manual shuffling of paperwork back and forth between contractors and our supply chain organization before we could get to a point where we could bring that contractor in as approved. So, so Joe, you, you mentioned some of the uh, other departments. Who, who were some of those key stakeholders uh, initially when you put this program in place, and, and, and maybe today, has it changed? Uh, I think it'd be helpful just to give everyone a sense of, of what that, uh, that stakeholder group looks like. At, uh, at Browse, we've certainly seen a change over the years uh, where this really is not siloed within any single department, but you've got uh, multiple uh, individuals within the organization that all uh, have a vested interest in this process. Is that true? Yeah, very true. You know, I think if you look at the way that we were set up initially when we started moving towards implementing our uh, our plan with Browse, I think, you know, my perspective would be is that we were a little segmented. I think that we viewed this process um, as, a, as a safety function and supply chain had it defined as a supply chain function. And we were going out and trying to implement um, without doing some of our due diligence on our side to get the key stakeholders defined, get them engaged in the process, get them understanding the value of doing this, getting the right people on board and creating a specific team that had the responsibility to not only develop the plan but manage the plan and work directly with Browse to ensure that we're successful. That's not the way we look today. I'm, today we are completely different, again, going back to the great people that I have the privilege to work for um, on my team and then also on the supply chain side that have come together and really in collaboration to include having you know, legal at the table, operations at the table, supply chain at the table, and then my group and contractor safety, um, really with an understanding of the roles and responsibilities within the plan um, who owns what, who drives what, and then really working together in concert with Browse to make sure that we're meeting our business objects. So, Joe, with, uh, with numerous departments involved in that process, was there a single overriding goal that everyone together had as an organization in, uh, in establishing a prequalification program? Yeah, I think, you know, simply stated, I think our business goal, you know, was and still continues to be that we wanted to ensure that we have safe, qualified, and trained contractors on our sites. The other goals um, that would be, you know, embedded in that would be strengthening our partnership with our contractors, ensuring a high level of compliance in the process, educating our key stakeholders of the value of the process, and then being transparent when deficiencies are defined 
you know, my team is, is really geared with continuous improvement in mind. We're looking for efficiencies to integrate into all our processes. So through some introspection, we found that we really had some redundancies in our program and processes that supported the evaluation and approval of contractors. So for us, it's really twofold. We were looking at putting ourselves in a place where we were feeling confident that beyond a surface level, we do have safe, qualified, and trained contractors on site, but also that we're removing some inefficiencies in our business work throughs. Okay, fantastic. I just want to remind the audience, we're getting a lot of really great questions coming in. Uh, we're going to do our best to uh, answer those throughout the presentation, and anything that we don't get to, we'll make sure to reserve some time uh, to answer your questions. So if we don't get to them right now, uh, please be patient. We want to make sure that, uh, that we get to as many of those as we can. Uh, Joe, just continuing on, you mentioned a little bit about strengthening the relationships with the contractors that you hire, and you know we, we're planning to address that uh, in more detail later on, but I'm just curious. Have you found that this type of program has strengthened those, those relationships? I think oftentimes uh, prospective clients uh, come in with concern that uh, their contractors may not want to participate. I'd just be curious your perspective. You know, I think originally we most certainly had some, some reservations from our contract partners to engage in this process with us. And I think fairly stated, we had some reservations internally with some of our work groups as well. I mean, it was, it was a programmatic change for us. Um, we, we really had to work hard as a group, um, really when we're looking at, you know, the whole life cycle management of projects and where the integration points of this process and then working directly with Braz for us to build a real successful plan. But yeah, we most certainly had some of our struggles. What I've seen though, Brett, is that as we moved in and, and gotten to the place where we're at within our project and our plan, is that Browse almost became, I guess I will call it a force and function. Um, it almost forced us to engage at a higher level with our contractors because that, that relationship that we have with our contractors is important to us. And we found that our contractors at times were struggling with certain things in our process. So in the registration, um, in the compliance phase, whether it was their safety manuals were deficient or certain elements of their programs were deficient. They were small companies um, that didn't have the robust programs needed, and a lot of it came down to us helping them and educating them on what the requirements were, why they needed to have them. Browse was instru instrumental in a lot of that communication and working directly with our contractors so that they started to understand not only what was in it for us, but what was in it for them. Um, you know, we really look at it and view it as now the way we've positioned ourselves, not just internally as our organization. I think the success that, that we've seen with our compliance rates and the confidence that we now have to say that our contractors that are coming in are truly safer, more qualified, and better trained than they were before we engaged in Browse. And I say that because if you remember back to kind of the discussion question about how we used to do it before, it was really surface level. And this has allowed us to really dig deep into the programs and elements and, and have Browse um, do the full reviews and, and define deficiencies. And the, what we look at then is that allows us to be confident to say that our contractors are safe, qualified, and trained. But we've also strengthened industry because now the contractors that we're using, we know that they work for other people too. We're just ensuring that other people are now engaging with, with safer, more qualified, and trained contractors. So, Joe, you, you mentioned the, the previous process. You also mentioned your current compliance levels. Did you have a sense of for where your compliance levels were prior to implementing uh, the Browse solution? Yeah, I think we, we always headed into it um, as we were starting in the development of the plan that we're on today. Uh, the end goal in mind is that we were going to have compliance rating of greater than 90%. And I think we've worked extremely hard to get to that point. We have at times, we're, we're kind of right now in transition of our last tier of contractors coming into the system, which has dropped our compliance rates down a little bit. But we've been as high at the end of 2015 at about 92 to 93% of all of our contractors in a state of compliance, meaning for us, 
you know, on the working end of the operation side of the business that a project manager in our system, in our organization, has a pick list of hundreds and hundreds of contractors that they can use. And, and to give some, some context to that, we have, we have over 1,100 contractors that are currently in Browse. Um, and those contractors right now, even in the mix of having a, a new batch, so to speak, we call them tiers of contractors moving through and are in the middle of the transition, we're still at 84% of those contractors in a state of compliance. Um, our goal was to be greater than 90%. We set our KPIs, our expectations internally for our organization is that compliance numbers associated with contractor safety are greater than 90%. So we expected the same for us. Yeah, congratulations on just a fantastic program. Uh, on our next slide, I'm, I'm going to ask Gil to talk a little bit about maybe from his perspective where he's worked with uh, so many browse clients, maybe what it is that you've done to be so effective from his perspective in achieving that 93, 94% compliance. But before we get to that, let's, let's just go back to the implementation process. How did you determine what types of criteria you wanted uh, to hold your supply chain accountable to? Uh, how, how were those requirements developed? You know, I think that there was, there's really two levels of that. So we've had our, our baseline requirements that were part of our contractor safety program starting back in 2009. Um, you know, statistically speaking, some of the requirements or qualification criteria for anybody to come do work for us is they need to have an EMR rate of below one their contractors' injuries and, and illness history rates, so ORIR, lost work date, and DART are below the industry average. No job site fatalities in the last five years. No willful or repeat OSHA violations in the past five years. And no more than four serious OSHA violations in the past five years. So that is, that is the baseline of acceptance to even get in the door to engage in conversations with us to do work. Beyond that, when we started working with Browse, we defined key metrics and we actually set up really a qualifications metrics that laid out the requirements really by, by industry type and by company type. So all the way down from an electrical contractor to a general contractor, there was a list of requirements that we built in partnership with Browse that is used by Browse to then measure our contractors and, and really paint us a storyboard so we can make an effective decision on whether we want to engage with them or not. Okay, great. And, and maybe I'll just take a moment here, Joe, for those who may not be familiar with uh, how Browse works with the client organization, just to kind of explain that process. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, we will partner with the client organization to identify the types of requirements they have for their supply chain. Uh, we would then configure our online software uh, to meet those requirements, send out invitations to contractors, suppliers, and vendors you might be working with, and ask them to complete online assessments, provide supporting documentation, and then addressing some of the administrative challenges that Joe mentioned earlier, uh, we would act as an extension of your team to help qualify uh, the documentation that has come in, and where there are deficiencies, act as an extension of your team to help educate uh, the contractors and suppliers who may not currently be meeting your requirements to help them become compliant to those standards. So hopefully if, if you're not as familiar with Browse, that helps to uh, paint a bit of a picture how we would interact. Again, it's all delivered through our online uh, SaaS-based software. Um, maybe, maybe just one last question before we move on uh, from this particular slide. But as you talk about the varying levels of risk within a supply chain, you know, you may have a janitor, you may have somebody who's working at height. How, how do you account for that risk within your supply chain? Do you require the same standards of everyone? Yeah, I guess, Brett, in my, in my opinion, um, this can only be accomplished with a level of safety integration or touch points in the life cycle management of any project. Um, it doesn't necessarily depend on what type of project it is. We've, uh, we've worked hard to really create, um, we call them touch points and really their flow documents that we've worked, again, um, in collaboration with the supply chain to kind of define where's the integration points for safety, for engaging with contractors um, in the very beginning from the planning stage all the way to post-project activities. And one of those crucial steps is to ensure that the contractors that we're engaging in are compliant in browse. And it's, it's nice for us to be in a position where we can now, we can now move 
you know, strategically kind of our priorities away from having to do the administrative side of the approval piece at a project level and really concentrate our time from a resource perspective on the things that really matter, and that's the integration of the safety processes that we've built. Fantastic. Um, specifically around risk, though, um, we do, in our portfolio with Browse, we have four risk levels of our contractors, and depending on the risk level defined by the contractor during the registration process on the questionnaire would define uh, the level of review that's done and the criteria that they would have to come do work for us. And it's not the same for somebody that's coming in to do, let's just say, for example, um, deliveries. Um, maybe it's coming in to, uh, to do some non-critical activities within one of our generation sites, and then maybe somebody that's engaged at working at heights or confined spaces or lockout tagout. Okay, great. And, and I'm sure you've had the same feedback that I've had. I think contractors and suppliers really appreciate that. Uh, having the, the various risk levels built into the system, I know it can be very frustrating for an organization who may not fit into a particular box to be forced to provide the same information that a very different type of contractor supplier might, might be required to provide. So I, I know there's significant uh, benefit to the contractors in having a system tailored that way. Yeah, and I think just to add on that, Brett, I would just say that, one, you're completely right, and two, because because our relationship with our with our vendors and our contract partners is such, um, we're able to have conversations about you know the registration phase and and them being able to tell us that you know yes um, you know according to my industry makeup you know I, I'm engaged and need to be qualified for confined space work. However, we don't do that type of work for you at XL Energy. And then having the ability to work to browse to any of those programs out if they don't apply, we can make it very specific to the contractor. Wonderful. Gil, are you still with us? Sure am, Brett. All right. I didn't want you to think I had forgotten about you, but uh, had some really good conversation with Joe so far. I was just curious, you know, we're, we're moving on talking about metrics now. Uh, you know, how organizations measure the success of these types of programs. Uh, Joe's talked about some of the great success that they've had at Excel, 93% uh, compliant. From a browse perspective and, you know, the number of clients that you've worked with, what do you think they've done effectively to be able to achieve that level of compliance? I, I know you're a big fan of uh, Excel and what they've done. I'd just be curious your perspective. Yeah, it's um, if you're working with them on a regular basis, almost a daily basis like I am, it, it, it's pretty easy to see. We, you know, I work with a lot of contractors or a lot of clients, I should say, on the, on the browse side of things. But one of the things that that clearly, in my mind anyway, sets Excel apart and their ability to to actively achieve that greater than 90% compliance is, is a couple of things. First of all, they have a, I would call it a true depth of knowledge and understanding uh, of their contractor base. Uh, and when I say that, here, just to give you an example, so we have a weekly meeting, uh, myself, uh, one of the other members of the Browse team, and then on the Excel side, they have basically what they call, I believe they call it the contractor review team, and that's made up of EH&S professionals, uh, purchasing or sourcing folks. We meet every single week, and during that weekly conversation, uh, we're not talking in, in just gross numbers. We, we do talk about percent compliant, things like that, but we actually take it down probably two or three levels beyond that, and this is where you become impressed with with Excel's level of knowledge and engagement with their contractors. We go down to a list uh, every week of every single contractor they have that is not meeting their compliance requirements. Uh, we talk about what those deficiencies are, what's what's driving their inability to be compliant with uh, with Excel's rules and requirements. And then in those conversations, um, you will have both the EH&S folks and the, the purchasing folks from the Excel side say, yeah, and we had a conversation with, you know, whatever, company XYZ yesterday about that deficiency. They didn't quite understand what we were looking for or they hadn't been asked to do that. Uh, what it comes down to is Excel has such a deep knowledge of their contractor base and such a good working relationship with them that even when the contractors 
do have those deficiencies or maybe just misunderstandings of what's being required or, or expected of them, um, they talk with them all the time on a regular basis, and we review that in detail with them on a weekly basis and constantly update them on who's compliant, who's not compliant, who's late on, on expiration dates and things like that. Um, just very, very, very detailed discussions by contractor name on where they're at because it, you see in the end, you know, I've been working with Excel now for about a year and a half. Their goal, and Joe, and Joe hit it right on the head, their goal isn't necessarily to eliminate or kind of lock out those contractors that can't make the grade. What, what, it, what seems apparent to me is their goal is to help those contractors improve to get to the point where they are meeting Excel's very high requirements um, so that they can, number one, continue that working relationship with them. Number two, you know, they're identifying and reducing the risk that, that's driving that, you know, maybe that non-compliant state, and everybody comes out ahead. Uh, Excel is getting to work with the contractors that they've worked with in the past and that they know and trust, and they're also getting that confidence that if there was some type of weakness, whatever it might be, in what that contractor was doing, they've worked together as a team to resolve that and to help those contractors improve. And so, you know, it basically comes out as a win-win for everybody. So, so Gil, I, I think that goes back to what we talked about earlier, that uh, that culture of, of a partnership between Excel and, and those uh, third parties that they have coming on site, uh, the collaboration and, and helping everyone to raise the bar and become better and safer organizations as, as a whole. There are a couple of other things that you mentioned that I think are really important. Uh, talking about the engagement uh, of Excel with their uh, their contractor base, as well as that communication. Uh, one thing I'm curious about from your perspective is how does enforcement of these types of standards influence or drive compliance and, and the creation of, of that culture? I know working in operations where I've spent the better part of my career with Browse, seems like those organizations that really stick to their guns and enforce these programs while educating are, are the most effective. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, I would because, uh, you know, I, you, you said we have quite a varied mix, I think, in the, in the audience today representing a lot of different industries, but it doesn't probably matter what industry you're from. You realize that if, if you use X number of contractors, those contractors talk to each other. They're working side by side with each other on, you know, on your property or your work sites or whatever, and they all talk. And a, in my mind and in my experience, a surefire way for a, for a contractor management program to fail is to not enforce the rules equally across the board. And I, and I, I say that from a couple of different standpoints, both internally and externally. Within, your, you know, within Excel's organization, they they are enforcing the they enforce their rules and requirements across the board. There aren't people within Excel that are that are trying to skirt the system or you know get around the process to bring in a contractor that maybe wouldn't make the grade. So that maybe enforcement is the wrong word to use within Excel. It's just their culture. They know it's the right thing to do, uh, and they're all pulling in the same way. And then with the contractors themselves, um, Excel has very clearly defined expectations and requirements of those contractors. They're very clearly communicated by both the Excel team and the Browse team. Uh, and in those instances where, where a contractor, for whatever reason, can't meet those requirements, Excel is very good at sticking to their guns. Uh, I'll add a caveat to that, though. And this is where this, I think, is another reflection uh, of Excel's excellence in this particular area. Just because a contractor on paper during a pre-qualification you know, process or event can't meet Excel's requirements, that doesn't automatically exclude them from the ability to do that work. Like I said, in those weekly meetings, we talk about that. And then outside of those weekly meetings, I, I have multiple calls and or emails with, with different members of that review team at Excel uh, on a weekly basis, to tell you the truth. And a lot of those conversations are around Again, company XYZ, they're not meeting our requirements, but here's why. Maybe they're, you know, they've done a deep dive, they've talked to the contractor, they found out that there's some overriding reason uh, or story that doesn't get told during the initial pre-qualification process. 
And so Excel will go back then with, with a good level of investigation, but also with flexibility in mind and say, okay, they're not meeting our requirements now, but we understand what the issue is, and therefore we're willing to work with them to help resolve that issue. And in the meantime, we're going to continue to do work with them. So they do a really good job of sticking to the rules and the outline of their program, but they also look at it in a, in a, in a realistic way. I mean, Excel's got a business to run. They have things to do. And if they think that they can help a contractor uh, overcome a particular obstacle until they can get compliant, they'll take a look at that and they'll make those calls on a case-by-case on a -case basis. Great. Great. I think that's really uh, helpful insight, Gil. Uh, Joe, when we talk about the metrics, how has executive management or executive leadership been involved in this process? Are, are they looking at these, uh, at these metrics? Uh, they are. So, you know, one thing I would tell you about the executive leadership in our organization is that contractor safety is very visible, and our executives and the board of directors have a high level of interest of the performance of our safety and the safety of our contractors. Um, you know, one example to that is is that when we have when we have a contractor that's working on one of our sites that has a significant safety event. So let's just say, for example, one of our electrical contractors has an equipment contact with one of our conductors. Um, we shut down the contractor and we do you know a very robust um, investigation analysis um, with the contractor. And one of the pieces that we have is that our executives at the highest level of the organization then call for those contractors to come in and meet face-to-face -face with them just to talk about it. And when one when thinks of that at the surface level, one would say, you know, this seems to be very punitive and um, a very formal process. But what you'll find is, is that the senior vice president of our operations group sits down and just engages in a conversation with them to ensure that, um, one, they have the right mitigation strategies in place, um, two, that, that their employees are okay. Um, we routinely, and specifically I routinely go out, and every time that I'm engaging in conversations with our partners, um, we talk about in the vein of, of that we need them, we care about them, and we appreciate them. And we have those levels of conversations which allows us then to be able to be really visible kind of upstream in our organization. So our executives and our board of directors um, see this, again, just like I said in the opening, really no discernible difference when you look at, you know, a key performance indicator for safety. Our contractor safety performance numbers is, is as important as our employee, our employee performance numbers. Um, we, have, we have lots of you know, as one would imagine, we have lots of different metrics and KPIs that are run internally. Because we took the time to really engage the right people at the right level in our organization, um, you know, we talk a lot about the supply chain organization because that's kind of the other side of this plan with safety. Um, we, have, we have metrics um, on the vice president of supply chain scorecard that is looked at every month. Uh, most of our operational business units also have scorecard items associated with compliance numbers for contractor safety. Um, we most certainly have our weekly conversations with Gil and Tasha and the rest of the team about where we are from a compliance perspective. So, yeah, it's it's heavily managed, um, you know, from, I guess, a numbers perspective on a compliance side. But to me, that means that it's being looked at at the right level by the right people to ensure that's a priority for us. Great. Uh, you know, I, I, I obviously uh, think you're very fortunate to have that type of uh, leadership within the organization. And, uh, you know, a question that just came in, uh, you might be able to help us with. The question is, do you have any insider suggestions for us who are trying to improve our company culture of safety? We believe we need to do a better job of pre-qualifying suppliers but are struggling to get traction in upper management. Uh, in, any suggestion? you know, perhaps for somebody who doesn't have the type of uh, leadership in their organization that, that you're speaking to, how they might be able to get that type of support? Yeah, I think, you know, the first thing that, that you need to do as an organization is you need to convey the value of the process. You know, they need to understand that whether you're engaging with a third-party administrator vendor like Browse or you're working off a historic process like we were before, the value in the process is the same. 
Um, people on the operation side of the business and the procurement side of the business need to understand why you're doing it and the value that it brings um, for them and for the organization. You know, it's really about limiting risk, and that's what engaging in a robust prequalification program does. You know, I would tell you that uh, one other thing to do is, you know, engage in someone, engage with someone like Browse because there's a lot of data that they can share to demonstrate the fact that getting engaged in a pre-qualification process bolsters safety at the site level. Um, it really does. There's a lot of work that's been done by Browse and Benchmarking and also with the National Safety Council that demonstrates the fact that being engaged with a third-party administrator supports worker safety at the project level and the site level. Um, but before you move forward and start defining your process and making the change to move in that direction, you need to engage the right people in the conversations about the value that they're going to see for their organization. And really for us, one of the key things that, that we started with was kind of the, the, you know, the limiting the redundancy in process and removing some of the administrative burden away from the operational side and, and the project managers and the supervisors that are already heavily weighted down with operational priorities. So being able to remove that and show them that there's value with someone else doing the work for them so that they can engage in the things that really matter on the project, which is managing the safety of it, really helped for us. And, and Joe, are, are there any other challenges that you faced early on um, that you think others might be experiencing uh, and any advice that you might have for them to, to overcome those types of challenges? Yeah, you know, I, I, was, I was thinking about this a little bit in, in prep for today, um, thinking someone might ask me, um, you know, one, how did you see the success that you did and, and, you know, any advice for me moving forward? And I would tell you that, you know, don't assume that safety processes and supply chain processes are aligned and synergetic. Integration of safety and supply chain, um, supporting the whole life cycle of management is, is not necessarily something that is always in concert with each other. So don't make the assumption that they are and that they're integrated together. I've talked to a lot of different people, um, whether it's in you know benchmarking opportunities or at EEI seminars where we're talking about TPAs, and contractor safety, and, and I've seen a real issue where some organizations will define, you know, one person to be solely responsible to manage this project, where they'll say, yeah, this is a good idea, or let's let's give it a beta test, and, and now, Joe, it's your responsibility, so you manage this project and move it through and work with Browse and, and not have a support structure or, or taking the time to be able to build a platform where you're collaborating with procurement and operations. And I just have to tell you, you you're not going to be successful. You just won't because you're missing that key part of getting the right people engaged and understanding, one, the value and the responsibility. So that's the first thing that I would do is don't make the assumption that, that supply chain and safety processes are aligned together. And, and two, um, don't try to take this on alone. Make sure you're engaging with the right people early and often. Yeah, you know, one, one thing that's really interesting is you mentioned that uh, interaction with procurement, uh, with supply chain. You, we're hearing more and more that procurement is really looking to be a, a value-added organization, uh, trying to step out of what historically has maybe been more of a, a supporting role. And, and so we are seeing that uh, procurement is being involved in these types of processes much earlier, working with safety, with operations. Uh, so very, very interesting uh, perspective that you offer. I'm just curious, what about pushback from contractors or suppliers? Uh, early on, I'm, again, I'm sure this was a, a different process for you, at least, at least in the regards that you were moving away from paper, they were working with a third party now uh, to submit this data. How, how did you overcome those types of challenges? Yeah, I think that, uh, that Gil would attest to this, is that uh, we most certainly have had some growing pains along our journey together. And one of those was some pushback from the contractors and suppliers. So I would, I would, I would tell you really kind of in, in two veins. One, just like getting your organization internally on board and seeing the value in the process, you need to engage with Browse to ensure that the contractors understand um, why you're moving in this direction. And there is inherent value for them as well as being part of a third-party administrator and working with Browse. Um, for us, some of the pushback came from really, you know, our smaller contractors, 
some of the the larger organizations that uh, that we're engaged with, you know, typically they've either had experience with this process before, whether it's they're already in the browse portal, or maybe they're they're working with another TPA. So it's not something new from them, and potentially they have a safety staff that's that's on board that can take this on. Um, it's not a new experience for them. But for some of our smaller contractors, really struggled in some of our remote areas where we had a need for business continuity, where we had to have this contractor and they were really struggling. And because they were struggling, they were pushing back, either whether it's from a cost perspective, um, a resource perspective, or a, a programmatic perspective. So what we did is we built, um, we just built some escalation processes. Um, we built some communication processes. And we, we built some tools, um, really with Browse. Browse is pretty instrumental in helping us create a template for a safety manual that we could offer to help support the contractors, um, to help them along their way, and really, in essence, kind of guiding them in the development of their own safety program. And that kind of goes back to the value that I'm seeing in the organization and that our executives talk about is, you know, we're helping the contractors strengthen their programs, which makes us stronger, which makes industry stronger. Um, it's just good for everybody. Great, Joe. Uh, we're we're going to move on. Uh, you know, the, the uh, presentation has uh, covered a lot of ground. Uh, we've got a, a large number of questions, so perhaps what we'll do is uh, move on with some of those questions, and then uh, I'll give you a chance just to kind of uh, summarize once we address those. Any additional advice that you would offer to the audience? Would that be okay, Joe? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so so the first question uh, it asks: What is the percent of contractors that excel and I think maybe what, what we're talking about is how many contractors uh, and suppliers are you currently managing inside of Browse? And I hope I interpreted that question correctly. Yeah, currently right now in our dashboard with Browse, we have um, 1,030 contractors that are actively engaged in some level of compliance in our dashboard. And that, uh, those are contractors that uh, represent all of our different business units. We made the decision when we decided to move into the transition into the pre-qualification world that it was, it was all of our contractors, all of our processes. We took a tiered approach, four different tiers to get us where we're at, but uh, we're in the final phase and that's all 1,130 contractors. Just to give a little more context to that, we have, um, we have certain business units, I'll use the transmission side of our organization, that about 60 to 65% of their work is completed by contractors. So we have a lot of contractors that we engage in. Um, kind of going back to my statement is that we need them to keep to keep our business moving. Great. And, and another question that uh, came in, and, and this is uh, getting into the weeds perhaps, and if it's better to uh, take this one offline and address it with the individual, we can do that. But the question is, how does Excel score their vegetation management land clearance contractors? Uh, their NAICS code is in the landscaping category, though their injury rates are much higher and understandably so. Uh, how are they scored? Did, we go, we, yeah, we go off a, we go off an industry average, so it would go off of the landscaping one, and their rates are a little bit higher. But going back to Gill, it really kind of depends on um, how they answer the questionnaire and about the actual activities that they're engaged in when they're working for us. And then, you know, for us, to stay, statistically speaking, Gil touched on this a little bit. So if they come in and their numbers are a little bit high, we have the ability to go in and kind of take that deep dive and have an understanding of that organization and make some decisions internally as an organization whether we're going to engage with them or not. Okay, great. Uh, another question, has there been any impact to your liability insurance premiums? You know, I, I can't answer that question, Brett. Okay, not a problem. Uh, another question that we've got here, are all suppliers required to register in Browse? Yes. So if they fall underneath our governance of our contractor safety program, and that means that they're engaged in construction and maintenance activities at any of our sites or working in hazard environments, they are required to be in Browse. Okay. It, is our, it is our sole process. And, and is there an internal prequal process for emergency work? There is. So we have emergent work processes, and then we also have, as part of the procurement process for bid letting, where we have a pre-qualifying portal where 
organizations as part of the bid package can submit their, their questionnaire, so to speak, so that surface level information to us. And then my team on our side internally takes a look at that and we kind of make a decision on um, you know, whether they would make it through the system at an initial level. And then if they were given the contract, then the expectation is, is that they would have a temporary approval for 90 days while they work on the programmatic side of coming through and getting fully vetted with Browse. Great. Another question, are subcontractors pre-qualified in Browse? And maybe I'll first uh, ask you for, for your response, Joe, and then, uh, Gil, I know you've got some great experience with CAP. Perhaps you could uh, also talk about uh, how subs are handled uh, within that type of program. So currently in, in our project or our process, the subcontractors are not required to register in Browse. Um, however, we do have specific questions in the registration for our prime contractors around do they use subcontractors, do they qualify those subcontractors, and there's a couple pass-fails in there for the general contractors. One being is, yes, I use subcontractors, and no, I do not pre-qualify them. That flags them in the system for us. Um, we do because of the relationship that we have with our vendors. A lot of our vendors come to us and ask us do you have any line clearance contractors that are approved in Browse? Um, or I'm looking for a civil um, construction outfit. Do you have any that are approved in Browse that we can engage with? And because we have that relationship built, a lot of those questions are handled at the project level. Okay, great. And Gil, just uh, curious, your perspective, uh, either working with uh, organizations like CAT or other Browse clients and how they, how you've seen uh, other organizations handle uh, subcontractors in the system. Yeah, some of some of them take the uh, the same view and the same basic path or process as Excel does. Uh, others, uh, CAD included, um, they require all of the subcontractors also to be enrolled in the pre-qualification process. The requirements are are a little bit different uh, between a subcontractor and a general contractor, but nevertheless. Uh, they do go through uh, the pre-qualification process as well, and I think uh, across the clients I serve and the ones that I the ones that I know about at Browse, it's a it's a pretty even split uh, between requiring subcontractors to go through the same or a similar type of pre-qualification process uh, like Caterpillar does, or in Excel's case where you're asking basic questions of the general or the prime. Um, but maybe not doing an in-depth pre-qualification of the subcontractors and putting that responsibility um, with the primes or the generals. So, so, Gil, it sounds like there's some flexibility within the Browse solution, how that can be administered. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The Browse, the browse solution will allow you to, to address it either way. Okay, great. Uh, Joe, going back to you, uh, there's a question here, is it possible to benchmark your processes? And I, I guess if I were to interpret that, if, if somebody were to uh, want to specifically benchmark with you, have uh, specific questions uh, about how Excel has implemented this type of program, uh, would, would you be uh, open to having somebody reach out to you directly? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, okay. how, we, uh, that's how we strengthen energy. Fantastic. Uh, another question, and I think we've touched on this just a little bit. How do you deal with small diverse suppliers or small dollar spend suppliers that struggle with either uh, the cost of the TPA or with safety requirements, uh, such as written safety programs? Yeah, so two different things, but what we did is, um, because we recognized this as, as a risk for us early when we were developing our plan um, and was most certainly brought to our attention um, really through our legal department and then also the operations side. Again, going back to, you know, when, when you're working in Minot, North Dakota and Earth, Texas and, and Muleshoe, New Mexico, there's some remote areas with some small contractors and they're the only one there and, and we need them, quite frankly. So how do we work through that? So my team, again, um, this was only successful because of the collaboration that we had within our, you know, we call it a, a TPA team, which is, the review team for contractor safety and then supply chain got together and we started talking through these issues and we, we built an escalation process or a working through um, with some checkpoints and decisions being made based off of the contractor, the risk level of the work, um, 
the amount of the contract and uh, kind of that defined need for us as an organization where we have come up with some solutions that we have to, to help with the cost side of it, whether it's uh, the cost goes back and the operation side is, is willing to cover the registration costs for the contractor, or we may go back to the contractor and just through some education, um, have some meetings with them one-on-one -on -one and just talk about, again, starting with the value piece to get them on board. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, programmatically, very same thing. I would tell you that, that my team has spent copious amounts of time on the phone with contractors and specifically working with them directly, whether it's the owner of their company, um, it's their operations guy, um, someone within their organization, sometimes it's, it's someone with an, with an administrative function, um, working in detail, going through deficiencies within their program and really helping them get what they need in place to be able to become compliant. Great. We're, we're very close on time. This, this next question is actually a good segue uh, to an announcement I just wanted to make everyone aware of, that we'll be hosting another webinar uh, on June 1st at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. And uh, the title of that is Contractor Management Strategies in a Complex World. If you're interested in joining us for that webinar, you can visit www.browse.com slash webinar. Uh, that particular question, Joe, was can you give some specific examples of metrics that are being tracked? Um, I know you've, you've mentioned EMR. I, anything else that, uh, that you would uh, include in those metrics uh, for sure. somebody who's considering implementation? Yeah, so a couple things that we measure right now. One is the compliance rates of our contractors in browse. <clears throat> so that's something that Ed Gill alluded to that you know, we, we manage and measure weekly. On some of our scorecards in the organization, they look at several different things based off of some business object reporting. Um, really, it's the compliance to the appendices that are part of our contractor safety program. So we have the Appendix B Bravo, which is a, which is a site level safety and risk assessment that needs to be completed that defines the scope of the work. Um, the hazard associated with the scope and mitigation strategies. Um, compliance to that is tracked. And then we have an Appendix D Delta, and the D Delta is the on-site orientation. So we also um, track compliance to that. Again, going back to the metric for us on all of these is uh, we're looking for greater than 90% compliance. Um, we have some others that are in place. Um, we have a pretty robust process for doing observations of contractors in the field. Um, again, supported through uh, an external website called Predictive Solutions, and we have some requirements of project teams to be going out and doing observations of their contractors that we track. And then finally, we have a post-project evaluation called the Appendix E Echo that is done at the end of the project or for long-term projects annually that we track compliance on. Great. Thanks, Joe. I want to apologize to everyone in the audience whose questions we weren't able to get to today. Uh, we'll reach out uh, following the webinar to make sure that you get your questions answered. Uh, Joe, with that, maybe just uh, one minute uh, left. Uh, any last-minute advice that you'd have to someone who is looking to create a culture of safety uh, by implementing a contractor prequalification program? Yeah, you know, I would tell you that, um, you know, in, in my opinion, there's, there's many benefits to using Browse as a third-party administrator. One of the benefits is really for supply chain project managers, field safety consultants, and others in your organization will not have to be involved with some of the historic roles and responsibilities that I talked about. Um, it, it allows you to really concentrate on your time that things that matter and remove some of the administrative burden of the process. Um, so I would encourage you to look at that as one of the true benefits of Browse. I will tell you that um, my, my relationship and experience with Browse has been one of candor and uh, one of, uh, of complete objectiveness. You know, our hope is that Browse probably has learned in their processes and, and their interaction with us just about as much as we learn from them. It's positioned us in the organization really to have a stronger program. I think, again, going back to statistics that we've seen both from Browse and the National Safety Council, that engaging with the TPA really does 
drive performance at the site level. And, and that's why we're all here today and, and engaged in the work that we do is to ensure that everybody, no matter if it's an employee or a contractor, that they have the opportunity to be in an environment where they get to go home safe and injury-free every day. Fantastic. Joe, Gil, I really appreciate the time. Sandy, we'll turn the uh, presentation back to you. Thank you very much, and on behalf of EHS today, I also would like to thank our speakers, Brett Armstrong, Joe Conrad, and Gil Dekoff for their presentation this afternoon, and Browse for making this webcast possible. I would also like to thank our audience for their time and attention. We hope you found today's webcast valuable, and we'll return for future EHS Today webcasts. Have a great remainder of the day, everyone. Thank you.